There's a revolutionary change in the ideas of the role of HDL in lipids, but also its role in coronary heart disease. And it's very confusing, not just to physicians and lay people, but to a lot of the researchers that are starting to look at all the different roles that HDL plays in protecting a patient from coronary heart disease. So let me start out with some very simple basics. LDL cholesterol is basically a garbage type of lipid that deposits in cells all over the body. And the HDL is like a garbage collector. It literally takes the LDL out of the tissue and removes it in a way that deposits it out of the body, usually through the liver. So the concept of HDL has always been, well, if you have a good HDL and a high number of HDL particles, you're going to have a good reverse cholesterol transport, which is a term used for taking LDL out of the tissues. And in the past, it's been said, well, if your HDL is elevated, if it's very high and it's based on your gender, that you're protected from having a heart attack or having coronary heart disease. Well, all that's changed now. No longer can we say that just because your HDL is high that you're protected. Because now it's looking at different forms of HDL. And also, does it even function? So what I want to try to present to you today is what is the present thinking about HDL? And this is changing, literally. Every month, there's a new paper, a new concept, or some new research. And there's also a lot of new tests that are coming out that will help you understand how HDL really works. So first of all, HDL is literally five different forms. And there's tests you can use to measure what's called HDL mapping. The HDL mapping includes alpha-1, alpha-2, alpha-3, alpha-4, and pre-beta HDL. That's the five types. And all of those are important. But in the past, the emphasis had been on the large, big HDL, which was alpha-1 in particular, but a little bit of alpha-2. But that concept has changed to the fact now that maybe all five of those are important. And some of the small particles, which are necessary to go and dock, literally, on the LDL tissue and remove it, are just as important in transforming to a larger HDL, which literally can handle more LDL, and then take it out and deposit it in the liver. So their size is important, but it's no longer just big versus small. It may be all types of HDL that are important. But even the size may not be the most important issue. What if you have all of the HDL particles, but they're not working? Something's wrong with the pre-beta, or maybe one of the other alphas. So the functionality is important. It's sort of like if you have a garbage truck with four flat tires. You know, you're not a big garbage truck, but it doesn't get to the site of picking up the garbage, so it's not functional. So HDL functionality, up until now, you really couldn't even measure it. Uh, you had what were called indicative markers of HDL functionality, but those were not accurately assessing the function of the HDL. But sometime in the next month uh, at the American Heart Meeting, there will be a revolutionary new test announced that causes the ability to measure reverse cholesterol transport. It's also called cholesterol efflux capacity. That simply means your ability to take LDL out of the tissue through one of the forms of HDL. So that will allow us to really determine the functionality of HDL with a lab test. And then it goes even more complicated. It's not just the type of HDL, it's not just the functionality, it's also the number of particles that you have of HDL. And the labs that measure advanced lipid testing call this HDL particle number, or HDLP. So the higher the HDL particle number, theoretically, by some of the recent research, the more protected you are from coronary heart disease and myocardial infarction. In fact, a lot of researchers have sort of taken the stance that the two most important things that you can measure now related to HDL are its function, and the number of particles. And if we can do both of those at the same time, we then can predict a lot better 
what the role of HDL will be in protecting you from coronary heart disease and myocardial infarction. So once you've determined what type of HDL you have, whether it functions and how many particles there are, you have to be able to design a treatment program that will allow you to fix whatever the problem is. And there are very few pharmaceutical agents that work. Most of these, in fact, don't change those three parameters of HDL. About the only thing that we found is some nutraceuticals and perhaps some nutritional changes that can modify HDL, either function, particle number, or particle size, and the different types. One of the things that's very important is pomegranate. Pomegranate juice or pomegranate seeds, for example, have been shown to change some of the enzymes in the HDL molecule and allow it to be better in transporting LDL out of the cells. Another nutraceutical that works very nicely is niacin. Not only does it increase the functionality, but it also can change the size and also make the entire program of HDL work better related to the other effects it has, such as antioxidant or anti-inflammatory or anti-atherosclerotic. And there are other things we use to make the HDL not be modified in a way that's negative. For example, green tea extract or EGCG can also uh, change the protein content or lipid content of HDL so that the composition is not damaged by different things like oxidative stress or inflammation. So dietary changes as well as supplements, and there's quite a few that are out there now that will be packaged hopefully sometime in the future into one product that may actually treat the different types of HDL issues. So there's hope, uh, I think, in determining whether HDL um, measurements, HDL functionality and particle number, can be processed in a clinician's office now and allow that determination through advanced lipid testing and then change the nutrition program, the lifestyle program, and also the supplements and even drugs to make the HDL do its best in preventing coronary heart disease and myocardial infarction. Let's assume a patient has come into your office now and you know that they've had problems in the past with their HDL. So what is your protocol to diagnose, evaluate, and treat that patient. The most important thing is to do an advanced lipid profile. And this requires specialized labs. They're available all over the United States now, which determines all the things we've talked about except HDL functionality, which will be a separate test. But it does get into HDL size and HDL particle number and total HDL content. So that's a start. And then when the reverse cholesterol transport test is available, you would add that to the advanced lipid testing. And once you have that information back, you're going to evaluate the three most important things we've talked about. If their HDL function is off, that would be the reverse cholesterol transport test. <clears throat> if their HDL particle size or particle number it does not meet the criteria that we have for HDL, then you're going to select nutrition or nutraceutical supplements to treat those. So let's take, for example, the HDL functionality is abnormal. Eventually, we'll have a list of supplements, some of which I went through already, along with your dietary changes that will change HDL function. So you do that program for at least two months, perhaps even up to four months, and you recheck the HDL functionality and see if it's improving. If it hasn't, you adjust the doses of the things in the HDL functional program or the formula that allows it to become better. If your HDL particle number is not high enough, then you again institute a nutrition program and a supplement program. There aren't very many drugs that really H increase HDL particle number. There's one out there perhaps that might, it's a fibrate, but most of the drugs are not effective for increasing HDL particle number. So again, same test, treat it with the appropriate supplements and or nutrition or lifestyle, weight loss, exercise, et cetera, and then reevaluate in about two to four months. And then the last piece is the HDL mapping. So you've got alpha one, two, three, four, and pre-beta. Now all of these are important. So when you do an HDL map, you'll find that some of these may be in the red zone, which is not good, some in the yellow zone, which is borderline, or in the green zone, which is great. So if they're all green, your, at least that piece of the puzzle is fixed. 
but if they're in the yellow zone, borderline, or the red zone, not good at all, again, you institute the supplement lifestyle program to change that and repeat it again in two to four months. So all this is in flux, determining baseline treatment and then reevaluation at a two to four month interval. And once you've achieved optimal levels of all three of those, you theoretically should have reduced the event rate for coronary heart disease and myocardial infarction in your patients.